Welcome back, everybody. This is another episode of Future States Focus. My name is Joseph Orozco. I'm the co-director of the NRA's Project for Alternative Futures. And Future States Focus is our series that we do uh, where two philosophy professors sit down and talk about short science fiction and fantasy films that are available online and on the on the internet, uh, largely through uh, the Future States series that premiered uh, nationwide on PBS about a decade or so uh, ago through the ITVS Film Network. Uh, and so we're here to do uh, another episode of Future States Focus. We haven't done one in a little while, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about what the state of Future States Focus is, but I wanted to introduce my co-host to you, uh, Robin Morris. Robin, how you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. I know it's been a while. We haven't, we haven't talked uh, together about uh, films for some time, so it's fun to be back here with you. Yeah, um, as you know, but our viewers don't know, I moved to California, so we had to take a break. Um, I'm still working at Prairie State College, but I no longer teach at St. Xavier, which is really sad for me. Uh, yeah, moving around takes a lot. I mean, a lot of big changes, of course, going on and pandemic reality. You moved across the country and then just uh, things get busy at this time. But I'm glad that you're here to talk uh, with me uh, about some of these things, uh, some of these films. And so, um, you know, Future States uh, is we've done about four or five of these discussions so far. Um, we started, I think, about three years ago doing this. Um, the, the interesting thing about Future States is this, as I mentioned, um, the series premiered on PBS about eight or nine years ago, uh, I think was the first season, maybe about 10 years ago on PBS. And we started uh, this series by looking at some of those early episodes of Future States uh, in the first and second series. Uh, and it turns out that, uh, uh, which unbeknownst to me, was that the license for broadcasting some of these things has expired. And in fact, ITVS started to remove some of the Future States Focus episodes from the YouTube site. And so some of the things that we talked about, unfortunately, are no longer available unless you really try to peck around on the internet and find them. Uh, we did a discussion uh, a little while ago about like one of my favorite episodes, White. And that's no longer available on the YouTube or the ITVS website. You can find it online if you sort of look around under the, the, um, the director's name. But I think our discussion about it is like one of the last remaining elements online of some of the things that we talked about, which is a shame because some of the films that I think we've talked about are, are really quite impactful. And so we're, we're doing some kind of like digital archiving here of some really important work, I think, uh, in a way, if you want to think about it that way, because my future states is, you know, the, the kind of um, defining element of it is that they're usually films by directors of color, by BIPOC directors, and usually somewhere or another, they involve cast members who are BIPOC, uh, or they deal with various kinds of social justice themes that impact communities of color or LGBTQ folk. And so uh, that's part of the reason why we've chosen to sort of do this is to talk about these films and like their bigger impact. But, um, you know, some of these things are disappearing. So we're gonna be retooling how we do our film discussions because we have such a good time together talking about these things, but uh, we're trying to preserve as many of the Future States Focus uh, episodes that we can talk about. Um, so today we're getting together to talk about the, um, film Children of the Northern Lights that premiered on Future States on PBS in 2013. Uh, so let me just talk a little bit about the, you know, the specifics of this film. The director and the writer of Children of the Northern Lights is Andrew Okpeaha McLean. He's an Inuit uh, 
director from Alaska. And he's most well known for one particular film that he made in 2011 called On the Ice. And On the Ice won the best first feature film at the Berlin Film Festival in 2011. Uh, won awards at the Seattle Film Festival, and then he won Best Director at the American Indian Film Festival in 2011 for On the Ice. That one is, in some senses, a little bit different. It's not a sci-fi film like Children of the Northern Lights, but it's a story of, uh, it's a morality play that plays out on the landscape of Alaska uh, among uh, a couple of Inuit brothers, I believe. Uh, so in some sense, there's some similarities to what we're going to talk about here with the Children of the Northern Lights. But uh, McLean is now the uh, an assistant arts professor at NYU, where he teaches film. And uh, the two main leads for this um, show are Michael Crane. He plays uh, uh, the, the husband of this duo, uh, he is uh, an astronaut, so it's the husband astronaut. It's hard to find a sort of a name. I couldn't remember if he was mentioned as a name in the episode, but he's not credited on IMDb for having a name. But Michael Crane is the actor. Uh, he has gone on after Children of the Northern Lights to uh, be in the series Succession. Uh, and now he's in the really uh, well-acclaimed series Our Flag Means Death. So uh, he's gone on to some good things. Uh, the other main lead uh, here who plays Lila uh, is Julianne Hanzella Kim. And she's had a variety of different kinds of roles since uh, being in Children of the Northern Lights. She was in The Good Life, Good Wife, sorry, Good Wife, uh, Blue Bloods. And uh, for several years, she was a cast member in the Netflix sci-fi show Manifest. So they've gone on to uh, continue doing uh, some good things and, and uh, working a little bit in sci-fi. But uh, McLean's work largely deals a lot with trying to preserve and to protect and to promote uh, ideas of Inuit cultural ways of life. And Children of the Northern Lights is a really peculiar film because it doesn't take place in Alaska. Uh, and as far as we can tell, the characters are not Inuit, but there are some themes and representations that speak to the existence of Inuit life in real life. So Robert, can you tell us about what this film is about? Yeah, so um, as you said, it centers around two astronauts. The film opens up and they're in a their spaceship and it has the male astronaut. As you said, I, I really don't think he has a name, so I guess I'm going to call him Michael. His first name's Michael. The actor's name is Michael. So Michael, he's in his um, spaceship and he's getting some readings back. We don't quite know what those readings are. Um, he goes back to wake up on another astronaut who turns out to be his wife, uh, Layla, and she comes forward and it comes apparent that what they're searching for out in space and on other planets are sources of energy um, to take back to presumably Earth. So um, just as they're making this sort of like, oh, yay, we finally found something. Uh, something hits their spacecraft and they crash onto the planet that they're currently surveying. Um, Michael wakes up from the crash. His partner, his wife, is uh, uh, unfortunately perished in the crash. He has this moment where he's talking to himself and he's saying, like, I'm not going to let this be in vain. I'm going to finish our mission, find the energy, take it back, take you home, you know. Um, so he puts on his suit um, eventually, and he sees the readings, right, where his spacecraft is running out of fuel itself to even keep him alive. 
So he puts on his spacesuit, he goes outside, and he sees for the first time some sort of entity that appears to be using the energy off of his ship. I think it's the energy. It could be anything that it's draining, but I think we're led to believe that it's draining the energy from the ship. Um, he sort of chases it away, and then he notices that there's a pool of something left behind. He doesn't know what it is, um, but this sort of sparks curiosity, right? So he goes off into the dark, searching for the energy sources that they scanned for. When he finds it, it's the same kind of pool that's left um, by his ship. And, um, and he sees that, like, the entity is around it. So he comes back, he gathers some stuff to gather this energy, takes it there, starts pumping it away. Um, the entity comes back and is very agitated by this and attacks him. Um, but it becomes very apparent that it can't really do anything to him. Um, you get the sense that maybe it's trying to communicate or do something to him, but he's not really getting it. So he continues to pump um, this liquid, and we don't know what the liquid is at this point. And he takes it back to his ship, and while he's pumping it into his ship, um, the entity comes back and watches him um, pump what's in his canister into the ship. And there's sort of an understanding there, I think, which is weird because there's no face on the entity, but you get the sense that there's an understanding of what's in the canister was what was in that pool on the entity's side. The entity then takes over the um, dead body of Layla. And there's this moment, right? It's sort of, uh, I don't know, old horror-esque, right? Where it's getting up and it's very um, trying to understand how to control this body in that moment. Um, and of course, Michael is like, holy crap my wife is suddenly alive. Like maybe I was wrong this whole time. Um, he takes her into the ship, tries to communicate with her. And there's a sense in which Layla is trying to communicate with him too. I really think that the entity was trying to say like, oh, maybe I can use this body to communicate to him what I'm trying to do. Right. Um, Frustration happens because communication is not happening, and um, he, again, leaves, or actually, I apologize, she attacks him and actually tries to kill him, and he assumes, like, she's just gone crazy because she was dead and now she's alive and kind of locks her in the ship and goes back to pumping this new fuel. When he comes back, She's disappeared from inside the ship. It turns out she's outside. She again attacks him. Um, and finally, there's this moment of communication where he comes to understand that what this fuel has been the entire time is a liquid within which um, this entity's children are um, sort of forming or um, gestating, I guess. And he realizes the cost of using this energy would then be the death of all of these um, creatures, which are plainly um, viewed to be sentient, right? It's very, it's clear that they have some sense of self. They have a protection over others of themselves, right? And they've been trying to communicate in some way. So there's an assumption of sentience here. Michael decides that the cost is too high and ultimately um, perishes himself. Uh, he lays down next to Lila and sort of counts the time down as his oxygen runs out of his suit and dies. Yeah, it's a, a, a really kind of, you know, interesting and tragic scene at the end decides that you know, as you put it, the cost of pumping away this energy source is too great. 
that there's an ethical cost to it and decides that uh, the better thing would be simply to let himself die um, by suicide uh, next to the body of his dead wife on this planet rather than start to extract it for energy for Earth or to right. save themselves, right? So uh, what, I mean, there's a lot going on in like this <laughs> like 25 minute short movie, right? A lot of different kinds of stuff. What did, what did you like about this film? I mean, I, I, I have to admit, I was a little weirded out at first because I was like, what is happening? And the creature looks like a mini sun, right? Um, I was like, what, what is going on here? And honestly, what I liked about it was that I think the, one of the messages that it's teaching is in that reaction that I was having myself. I like to think that I'm an open-minded kind of person, but it made me realize like how narrow my sense of life is. And I've thought this for a long time about humanity. And one of the reasons why we probably shouldn't be out exploring the galaxy is like, we, we have a very narrow understanding of what constitutes life and sentience and personhood. Right. And we can see that from the way we treat each other. And we treat non-human life on the planet. Um, and so I, I was like, oh, I think that I do pretty well, but maybe even I shouldn't be out there exploring the galaxy. That's what I liked, is it pointed out to me through my reaction to that being that, ooh, maybe I'm not doing as good as I could be. That's really interesting. No, I mean, so, you know, for our, our, our listeners and viewers, right, the, the entity is depicted as like this, it's, a, it's an animated ball of yellow light that sometimes has these kinds of like uh, filaments or tentacles that kind of, not, not, not very like um, uh, octopus-like, but sort of like these, these very thin wisps of, of arms that kind of like some sort of sea creature or something, but it's like a ball of yellow light. And the, the, the liquid is this uh, fl kind of fluorescent yellow pool, right? Which you can't really see, but in, there are some shots in there where they sort of do like microscopic views and you can see little balls of these entities inside the liquid that is apparently some kind of energy source. Uh, what, I, what I thought it was interesting about this, because I was trying to think like, you know, what's the... Um, what's the title about children of the Northern lights and uh, started to think about like, what's the bigger story here? And, you know, the Northern lights, the Aurora Borealis. Right. Um, and I started to think, well, so I know that McLean is uh, Inuit from Alaska. And I started looking around to think about like, what are the myths and legends of the Northern lights for native people in Alaska. And there's all sorts of different kinds of stories about what the Northern lights represent. Um, but what was interesting was that in, in some of these stories, um, the Northern lights, the Aurora Borealis in, uh, represent like the heavens, the, the afterlife uh, for some Inuit people near like Barrow, Alaska, which I believe McLean is near, uh, the aurora borealis are dangerous, and so there used to be a tradition of carrying various kinds of special knives to fight against the northern lights because they were known to swoop down and cut off people's heads uh, and stuff like this. So there's all these sort of stories, but also the the northern lights are sometimes represented in these stories as balls of light that the gods or, or the spirits of the ancestors play games with. So when the Northern Lights are dancing in the sky, uh, some of the, uh, the Inuit folk uh, thought that that was a game amongst the spirits of the, the, the dead or of, uh, uh, of their gods, their deities. So, you know, it could be a playful thing. It might be a dangerous thing. Uh, but I think that that's what this title is sort of trying to get at is the, the, this kind of notion of the, the real specialness of these creatures. Uh, and uh, the kind of sacred quality of them in some sense that eventually, as you pointed out, Michael comes to appreciate, uh, which he didn't do at the beginning. He sort of just saw it as an energy source, but began then to see it as something else that he had to respect. 
Yeah, I think that's right. And on the real, like, obvious level of this, it's a story about, you know, what what are the costs for getting more and more and more of what we want, right? Um, yeah, you know, that's the thing that, you know, when I first saw that, well, I wanted to talk about one scene that, like, what, what I think is really masterful about this scene is, like, you pointed this out, right? There's that moment where the 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 ball of light uh, is watching Michael pump the gas essentially into his ship, trying to get ready to go. And, you know, he's put Lila's body out uh, into the planet covered with a sheet. And, you know, he's, this is a, an atmosphere. Uh, there's no atmosphere on this planet that they're on. And it's very sort of barren uh, and dark, uh, no light. And, you know, the light, creature moves along and it sort of uh, goes inside Lila and the way that it's filmed is you see him pumping the gas into his car <laughs> right and then in the background uh, you see in blurred you see her body and all of a sudden she sort of sits up <laughs> and then you know there's the scenes of her like her corpse being animated walking over to him and what's creepy is not only like the way that she's walking because you know the creature is using her body uh doesn't know exactly how to make it work um so really good acting by uh, julia and kim to sort of capture this kind of like zombie walk kind of thing but also it's like there's no oxygen so like how is it possible that and you know and it's the vacuum of space like so it's it creates that horror element really well like how is she out here and she's been dead for you know at least a couple of days already and now she's walking without a spacesuit like what's going on so i really loved that i think that that was really well done in the in the film it it captures a really sort of good kind of horror moment in it but um uh you know what's what, you know the bigger sort of message that spoke to me was like you know what's the choice at the end the the sort of dilemma is this is an energy source they he could use it to get the ship off and return to earth he tells the corpse of layla at some point that there seems to be enough of this that it could be a significant energy source for earth and it seems like you know if they're going out to space to search for this kind of stuff it seems like there's like an energy crisis back on earth so this could be useful but once he recognizes the the fact that it's essentially like the life fluid of these creatures right he has a choice he could either continue the extraction of this material for his own self-preservation and the preservation of human beings or he can die on the planet uh and not extract it and so you know th those are his choices but then he chooses and he chooses to die and not extract these resources, these, these, these beings, not to treat them as resources. So there's this ethical dilemma and it's an interesting choice as to why he decided to do that um, and not extract it. Yeah, and importantly, it's also the other side of that is he's not taking this information back to anybody else either, yeah. right? So it's not just like he himself is choosing in some real way, he might also be denying and protecting these um creatures and these life forms from other people right it um and we talked about this just a little bit before it evoked a little bit of the trolley problem for me right because um oftentimes when we teach the trolley problem um for those of you who don't know there's sort of two halves of it right you can pull the lever and save people and kill one, or you can push a person in front of a trolley, and save people. And um, when we teach it, oftentimes, like in my experience, students will say like they're okay with pulling the lever, um, but they're not okay with actually being the person to push somebody in front of a train to save others. And there's sort of this, and I feel like when I watch this, or when somebody else watches this, we're very understanding of his choice we think yeah that was the right decision but i often don't think about the harm that's being done when i pump gas into my car right and the outcome is often the same 
you know, the way that we use our planet and exploit our own planet has the same consequences in a lot of ways. We subject animals and plants to extinction. Um, we subject other humans to terrible conditions. Um, and I, in my own life, don't give, I don't think, enough thought to that right? In the same way that my students don't necessarily understand that whether you pull the lever, whether you pump gas into your own car, or you kill, you go to space and you kill off the species, the end result is the same. So why, why does it feel different? What's the morality actually different? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was thinking about this too, because I was trying to think like, what what would motivate Michael to do that, right? Because after all, like their mission was all about energy extraction. That's what they were there for. And, and as you pointed out, right, he says, I'm not going to make this uh, mission like when, you know, when they crash and, and Layla dies, he says, I'm not going to let this go in vain. And so you think he's going to try to fulfill the mission and not let her life's work be wasted in some accident. But you know, so you get the sense that, you know, he's going to go through this and if he's found this and it can be useful for humanity, he's going to try to do it. Um, but that's not what he does at the end. Like you, like you said, he dies, uh, Layla dies and he denies humanity the information about this available resource life form. Um, and so I was thinking like, why, what would motivate him to do that sort of choice? And I think that this is where McLean, the director writer steps in, because I was reading some stuff he was talking about. Uh, with um, his film On the Ice, where, you know, that one, that film specifically deals with Inuit culture and Inuit characters, unlike uh, Children of the Northern Lights. But there's something similar in there, you know, and I, as I mentioned this before, the, the landscape of this planet is very barren. There's not a lot of features to it. It's inhospitable. They have to wear spacesuits to be outside. Uh, it's hostile uh, to human life. It's dangerous, but there are these resources out there, not unlike the Arctic homelands of many of the Inuit people. Uh, and so there was this quote that I read in an interview with um, with McLean that I wanted to share, uh, where he's talking about the film uh, On the Ice, uh, which has to deal with the sort of fallout of uh, an accidental killing. And he writes that part of what he was doing was bringing in the desolate environment of uh, Alaska as, a, as a, a really crucial part of the storytelling. So he, he, he writes it this way, quote, I think part of being out there in this incredibly open, desolate landscape gives the feeling that the characters could get away with anything. We created a kind of moral ambiguity. You bring your morality with you, and you can't escape it, even in places like that. So I was thinking about that is, you know, uh, the, the landscape is such in this film, uh, Children of the Northern Lights, that, you know, he could use the pool of energy to save himself and to get back to Earth and then possibly be a hero to humanity for bringing this new, uh, this new fossil fuel in a way to humanity so many lives could be improved in that way who knows what the situation of earth is but if they're sending spaceships out to find energy it seems like it could be pretty bad back here on earth uh, so this is important but you know he chooses not to um because he you know some kind of moral sense in him recognizes that it would be wrong to use these creatures for that purpose and i think that this is where you know not to be too simplistic about it but i think that this is where maybe the uh, mclean's kind of inuit message is coming across about the idea of simply exploiting the environment for our purposes as human beings um, this is a, something that's been confronting Inuit communities now for several decades as we confront climate change and, you know, and the, and the ways in which the, the Arctic environments are, are altering, which is altering their ways of life. 
but they understand that their ways of life have always been tied to a certain kind of equilibrium with the, the environment. And it seems like something that Michael in this film sort of comes to terms with too, is that he can't upset the balance of this world simply to save himself or, um, or humanity, even as a whole. And that seems like, that seems like a, like a hard kind of call to make in a sense is like, you know, I wonder what motivates Michael to make that sort of decision for himself. And I think there is that lesson that, you know, we shouldn't take the sort of easy route of thinking that, you know, it's, it's simply a numbers game. Mm -hmm. Our lives versus, right, the millions or so that could benefit from this back at Earth. It's not quite a utilitarian calculus that way. There's something deeper about the respect of this life form uh, that perhaps is, you know, a reflection of the kind of Inuit mentality that McLean wants to infuse into this film. Yeah, definitely. And I think, that, you know, we don't need to look any further than our own planet to understand how our quest for energy and um, just in general, more things. Um, and I mean our, as in like the capitalist, materialistic cultures um, has directly impacted the ability of native cultures, first and foremost, around the globe to um, have um, autonomy, have their cultures respected and kept whole, right? Um, I mean, I think about like pipelines destroying water sources and how deeply that affects native cultures, right? That's something that's present to me as here in the United States, but this doesn't, you know, this isn't just a United States problem. This is a problem that's global worldwide, right? Like our conquests, our need, our greed in a lot of ways are always going to first affect and destroy native cultures, um, indigenous peoples. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's really powerful to think about because, uh, you know, I, th what brought to mind when you just mentioned that and I was thinking about this when I was thinking about this film was that it reminds me of like all the struggles that we're having about the the pipelines now in Canada, right? And so, I mean, it's literally like putting a line into the earth to extract these resources and all the damage that it could do primarily, like as you said, to native communities and their autonomy, right? Because a lot of this stuff is on uh, First Nations lands in Canada. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have said, no, you can't do this. But governments of both Canada and the United States have said, this is necessary, right? This extraction of natural gas and other sort of fossil fuels is necessary for our way of life. If we want to maintain like oil independence from, you know, foreign uh, sources. From the boogeyman. And, yeah, from the Middle East or, or, or whatever, which is just now exacerbated with all of the kinds of problems that are going on in Ukraine with Russia. Like we need to find sources for this. And there's, there's this stuff laying around, right? But not easy to get to. Uh, and then there's these moral questions, right? And so the question like, you know, what is the cost of maintaining our way of life built around fossil fuel extraction uh, when you have these other kinds of considerations of like autonomy, preservation of species, preservation of cultural ways of life? Uh, you know, that's why I think that Michael's choice is, is, you know, that the choosing to die rather than do these, do the extraction is, in a kind of way, it seems like so um, opposed to the sort of dominant mainstream kind of white capitalist mentality, right? You would expect to say, like, screw it, let's just get home. Yeah, I mean, it absolutely is opposed to it, right? Because at the end of the day, what he's doing is he is, as you said, rejecting this sort of moral calculus, the utilitarian viewpoint. And when we think about it, when we say, oh, we need to do these pipelines to preserve this kind of way of life, what we're at the end of the day saying is our way of life is better, more valuable than your way of life. Yeah, right? it's total. It's a total settler mentality. That's I mean, what's interesting uh, get, in another way to put it is like at the end, Michael rejects the settler mentality. He, he refuses to extract these 
these beings and he refuses to share the information with the rest of humanity for the purposes of colonization and exploitation of this planet so it's really it's, it's an interesting sort of thing because it's kind of counter to what you might expect uh, given the history of humanity up to this point yeah exactly and um it adopts right that kantian view of like we cannot treat other beings I'm going to expand Kant to say beings, right? He only talks about humanity, but I think there's a way that we can understand him as saying like sentience Mm -hmm. um, um, as things, as merely objects, as merely beings. Um, And instead we have to understand uh, beings or sentience as ends in and of themselves, as inherently valuable, as inherently worth protecting. And yeah, I mean, I think that's that not something still, that could be violated. Yeah, I mean, you you mentioned this too before, right? When we were talking about how this also raises questions uh, about space exploration, and you know, like what is the mentality that we will take out there? At the beginning of the film, it's sort of like it seems as though they they are just doing the kind of typical settler mentality. We're out here to colonize, to extract resources, take it back to the the metropole and then it switches around the story at the end and they decide you know michael decides not to be that kind of a colonizer settler but it raises questions about like you know how should we go out into space or even should we right so there's all the, there's all sorts of debates about this you know specifically now that there have been all these like you know dreams and aspirations by various billionaires about space programs right should we be even bothering about that if we are going to do this, right, if we are having our, our eyes set on, you know, Luna or Mars, like, how should we think about going out there? And is it going to follow a pattern of settler imperial colonization that has characterized humanity from the, the outset whenever we see a horizon? I mean, that's one of the interesting things, like, for instance, about like this, the series, The Expanse, is that it shows the consequences of just continuing on with the way that humanity has always been historically, you create a whole lot more sort of opportunities for oppression in space. It's just same problems, different setting. Uh, What I like about Children of the Northern Lights is it really gets us to think about like, maybe maybe we shouldn't approach the question of space exploration with the same mentalities as we've done exploration for centuries. Right, and maybe until we can really adopt a more Kantian ethic when thinking about life, um, maybe we're just not ready, you know? Mm. And I'm, look, I'm a Star Trek fan. You know this. I want Star Trek to be the reality as much as every other Star Trek fan. But this also got me thinking about the beginning of sort of the Star Trek universe, right? How important was it that the first aliens that humans interacted with in Star Trek were Vulcan? Or humanoid, right? Mm. How important was it that it wasn't sort of this other being that doesn't have a face, doesn't have, you know, the ability to communicate, isn't advanced enough to communicate in our own language, right? Yeah. How how important was that to actually beginning of Star Trek? Yeah. Um, because even in Star Trek, people who are the best at you know, interacting with other cultures uh, still have trouble with creatures that are not humanoid uh, yeah. routinely. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. Uh, you know, and the Vulcans only differ from us on the surface in terms of like their haircut, which everyone their on the damn planet seems to have, and the, and the ears, right? Uh, yeah. But um, and you know, and the other, I, I think that this is true about like the way Star Trek represents difference in a lot of ways too. Um, you know, if you think about like the representations of artificial intelligence and stuff and robots, the evil ones are always mechanized things or, or faceless. But mm-hmm. if it looks like a human, like uh, Data, then it's okay, right? And so there is this kind of like bias towards what looks familiar to us. Uh, and, you know, that raises that whole sort of question that, you know, our, our moral imagination is still very limited in terms of what we consider to be, you know, within the circle of human. You know, there's one sort of way of thinking about like this story of human rights and, and progress is thinking that what we're doing is expanding the, 
the 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 circle of the people that we consider worthy of moral consideration and you know and it's a struggle historically just to expand this and to get people and i think richard rorty makes this argument right is that Mm -hmm. we don't need any more sort of ethical theory about like what it means to treat people well it's just a matter now of trying to figure out like who do we count as people right Uh, and uh that seems to be and that seems to be part of what's going on here in this kind of question too about like you know do we consider the do we consider entities like the the northern light creature here sentient is it a is it a is it a creature is it an animal it, 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 the, you know how do we extend moral consideration to it um this is really the hard work right i think of of, of ethics is trying to figure out like why is it that human beings are so um so tribal in the sense that we have such a hard time trying to figure out how to extend the circle of what it means to be a person or of moral concern. Right. And um, it's interesting that you brought up like data, right? The Mm -hmm. Android. Um, I was just talking to my husband about this the other day. We were watching Picard. And as you know, the actor who plays data is in the second season of Picard and he doesn't play a very nice person. Right. And I was telling my husband, who's also named Michael, uh, how uncomfortable it makes me to see data in a more evil light. And even in Enterprise, it made me really uncomfortable. Like Lore, the evil data, made me really uncomfortable to see data, right? Because as you know, and people who have watched Star Trek know, it's the exact same actor, and he looks the exact same to be evil (laughs) it's it is interesting right that idea of like how my brain and our brains work to ascribe morality to the things that look a certain way right it's very uncomfortable i do not like lore at all because i love data so much yeah it's that sort of i think what it's called the uncanny valley about like trying to like you know what's that that moment of unease that we experience when we realize that something is not not as it should be right or when we think that something looks human and then realize oh it's not the experience you get like if you're watching like you know uh, some of the more advanced kinds of ai robots that they have out there now that actually you know, can interact with people and have conversations and talk with people and are made to look human, right? In fact, I think it was, I, I've seen this, you know, going around, I think Saudi Arabia or, or some country has extended personhood rights to certain kinds of advanced robots like that. So oh, we're already on their way to thinking about this kind of stuff. And But some of these things, I mean, I don't know, I always get creeped out whenever I'm, we're wa- watching some of those Boston dynamic robot videos of them mm-hmm. dancing. And, and it's like, I... I don't want to, I don't want to see the robot dancing. <laughs> I don't want to see it like climbing stairs and opening doors and stuff like that. Cause I, I think like, what, what's going to happen to this? And lo and behold, right. You know, the, the dog robots that they've created, you know, now they're being used by uh, the department of Homeland security for border patrol uh, along the U S Mexico border. Right. Uh, so they're piloting these kinds of robot uh, watchdogs. Uh, and if you've watched Black Mirror, right, there's an episode, mm-hmm. uh, right, that shows these things being weaponized. It's not very far away. I imagine that you could create not only surveillance drones, but weaponized drones uh, like that. And so it, all that stuff always just like it creeps me out, not because it's uncanny in that way. It creeps me out because I always worry about like what's the what are the heinous or nefarious purposes that this could be turned into, given that we turn almost everything that we create at some, it seems at some point into a weapon against one another. And that's why I think that choice that Michael makes in the film at the end is so unique. He chooses not to, you you know, uh, use these creatures in that way as part of that story of humanity. He really, he really chooses differently than the historical uh, record for settler communities and maybe makes a choice that would be understandable to Inuit people. Um, I mean, I think that that's the other thing, you know, I, I don't want to say too very much about this in, in this sense, cause I, uh, you know, I don't, I don't speak for Inuit people and, 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 and in any ways, and I don't claim to know very much about this, but 
you know, there are, uh, you know, from what I've read in anthropological studies of, of you know, folks, like there are practices of, of sort of ritual suicide historically among some of these uh, peoples uh, having to do with protection of resources, right? And so uh, sometimes folks would uh, do honorable kinds of, of, of self-harm in order to protect the community when times were tough and, you know, the hunt didn't produce as much resources. So I'd have to do sort of more story, uh, more, more looking into this to sort of tie it into the story. But I think there's a lot of these kinds of hidden elements of, um, of Inuit sensibility that are being built into the kinds of moral choices that Michael makes here. Uh, in this film that make this film very, very powerful morally. Yeah. And uh, honestly, I think it's something we could say is it's a choice I, I hope, I wish we would all make given the mm. same circumstances. And it's a choice that I hope we can find a way to do in our lives today, right? To maybe not like commit suicide or whatever, but how do we... Uh, make better choices in centering um, indigenous people in these discussions? How do we um, make up for the wrongs and the harms that have been done in the past? How do we start fixing these things now? Yeah. Right. I mean, we did a, we did an episode about this in terms of thinking about like reparations for the past, uh, particularly with Native folks one of our epi one of our previous episodes touched on this which unfortunately i think both of those films about remembrance and reparation for the past i think both of those future states episodes are no longer available online uh at all they're not on the future states U youtube page and i don't I happen to be, i went back trying to locate them anywhere and i don't think those filmmakers have made them available so uh it's a drag but uh those are a couple that was a, a good discussion i think we had about like what is our what are our duties to the past and to pass injustices to repair them today. And so I think that that's something that comes up here a little bit, but I think also too, this kind of question of like, maybe in thinking about the preservation of life and, and ways of life like this, that something has to die mm. or something has to stop. Right, and hopefully that's this colonizer, right? Attitude, yeah. mentality, action, thing materialism yeah. capitalist crap that we have going on and that's a that's a hard thing to sort of figure out like what that will look like in someone's so yeah this is this is a, a really evocative episode i think of future states that brings up a lot of kinds of issues about where we're going touches on some of the kinds of political struggles that we're seeing now with the pipeline issues in canada and north america so um uh, a thumbs up from me as a as a good uh, a good episode for discussion about social justice issues uh, in the world today. Yeah, definitely thumbs up from me too. Double thumbs up. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, thanks for hanging out with me for a little while, Robin. It's always good to see you. I hope that we can uh, get together again to do another film discussion soon, uh, and uh, uh, you know, bring out some of these perspectives uh, uh, and show how sci-fi can be useful for a springboard for consideration of the kinds of ways in which we can build a more just world and just future. So thanks a lot for being here with me. Well, thanks for having me. It's always such a pleasure. Um, you know, now that I'm not there at Oregon State, I miss our discussions. So it gives me a little, little taste of being back there. So. Well, you know, everyone is on Zoom now, so, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, we're all on, uh, this is how we live virtually in, in, in the world these days, but thanks again, uh, and thank you all for listening and tuning in to our uh, video channel and hanging out with us a little bit. Uh, you can uh, listen to our audio podcast uh, at Anchor FM Spotify, just look for Anare's Project. Uh, and you can also find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us uh, on Instagram. Check us out. Let us know what you think. Uh, leave us some comments down below if you're watching our video and let us know uh, if you have a chance to uh, view the Children of the Northern Lights. We'd love to hear your comments uh, and reflections about this film too. So thanks once again, Robin, and thanks you all for sharing your time with us. Thank you all.